Our next guest is top Republican strategist Stuart Stevens. He is known for advising key campaigns like Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential bid. And he's now written a powerful mea culpa for The Washington Post, placing the blame for President Trump's failed response to the coronavirus squarely on the shoulders of all Republicans. Our Michelle Martin talks to him about his new book, which is called It Was All a Lie, How the Republican Party Became Donald Trump. Stephen says he's given up any hope of the party changing anytime soon. Stuart Stevens, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, I, I don't think it's a secret that a lot of members of the Democratic opposition, certainly a lot of independent scientists, and, and frankly, a lot of analysts around the world have been critical of the way the Trump administration has handled this current crisis. And you wrote a piece, a very provocative piece, I have to say, for the Washington Post saying, don't just blame President Trump, blame me. I'm reading here, and all the other Republicans who aided and abetted, and yes, benefited from protecting a political party that's become dangerous to America. Some of us knew better, but we built this moment and then we looked the other way. Those are some pretty strong words, so let's take it step by step. First of all, why do you say blame you? Well, look, uh, you know, for 30 years, I've been helping elect Republicans. I've elected to help Republican governors and senators in over half the country. Um, so I think one of the principles of Republicans used to be that we believed in personal responsibility, and that's totally gone out the window now. We're against personal responsibility. But it seems to me if we're going to return to that, the first step is personal responsibility. And I can't say this just happened. I was part of it. I was deep into the machine, um, worked in five presidential campaigns for Republicans. Um, so I was there. I saw it. I would like to have done things differently in retrospect, but can only move forward. Let's talk about the coronavirus pandemic specifically. How are your observations about the, the state of the Republican Party relevant to what's going on now? What, what's the connection? Well, I think the Republican Party has failed tremendously on this. Um, the idea that somehow when you look at these polls that there are more Republicans aren't believing the reality than, than Democrats. It's insane. And it's because it, when Trump is out there saying crazy stuff, there's really nothing you can do about Trump. Um, but, but you have to go out and tell the truth. And Republican leaders should have been out there earlier. Um, you know, it, it's just, you know, I look at this drug chloroquine as an example. And it means something to me because uh, I had a very, very bad case of malaria. In fact, I wrote a book called Malaria Dreams, where I took chloroquine. So uh, the idea that this very powerful, potentially dangerous drug has somehow become a political issue is just so sort of a perfect little metaphor for our moment. I mean, we have pretty safe drugs in America because we have a system that works. So somehow we're saying we shouldn't trust the FDA, that we should listen to Donald Trump or Sean Hannity about what drugs to take. I mean, that's, uh, that's a short walk to Jim Jones. But how do you see the state of the Republican Party as you see it affecting the government's ability to deal with this crisis? What we most need now in these moments of crisis is a sense of what can be ag agreed upon truth. And Trump is, and the Republican Party has assaulted the concept of truth like nothing else in our modern politics. So just at the moment when we, want, we need to believe someone, we need to believe experts, we have had this unprecedented assault on what are facts. I mean, it's all thing about alternative facts. And I think that's incredibly uh, dangerous. I mean, it is what happens in Russia. It's what happens in, in totalitarian societies where you believe the government, it's 1984. Who do you believe? So I think that in itself we're, we're sort of reaping this terrible uh, uh, sowing of mistrust uh, among all our institutions. There was this recovery bill. It was passed by, you know, enormous margins. Does that s suggest anything to you, that perhaps the Republicans uh, are able to work with Democrats, that the parties are able to work together on recovery efforts? I think there was a unity of fear. <laughs> unity driven by fear. I thought it was very positive that that passed 97 uh, to nothing. Um, I think that's the sort of thing that begins to uh, 
reinstall, uh, reinstill faith in government, uh, which is critical at this moment. Um, I think it's going to be woefully inadequate. Um, I'm personally, and I'm no expert, but a pessimist on where this is going. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was positive. Yes, I think it would have been very negative had that p passed by party line votes or one vote or two votes. So I'd put that in the, in, the, in the positive side. Look, these are not dumb people in the U.S. Senate. Um, they can read and they understand math and they can look at this and they're all talking to medical experts themselves. So they may not go out there and contradict Trump every day, though they know they should. But when it comes down to it, they know they had to vote for something that would help people, if for nothing else, to save their own skins. Because this thing is going to move out of New York, I think, into rural uh, states very quickly. And you're seeing it in Louisiana. And I look at my home state of Mississippi, and I have very foreboding feelings about it. I mean, you have a, a, a collapsing for many, many, many years rural health care system that much has been written about and little done about. Um, you have the most unhealthy uh, collection of, of citizens in the nation. Um, and I think it's a, it's a potentially catastrophic mix. Um, hopefully it'll get slowed down enough that they'll be able to take care of it. How did this start in your, in your view? How did this whole fixation on elitism, this turning away from, from science and from fact, how did, what, how did this start in your view? Well, in my view, the original sin of the modern Republican Party is race. Because if you go back to Eisenhower, 1956, Eisenhower got almost 40% of the black vote. You go to Goldwater, that dropped to 7%, and it never really came back. So for the last, you know, since 64, Republicans really have been marketing to primarily white voters. So what does that mean? That means you get really good at, at a very uh, homogeneous group of voters. So it used to be the largest group of white voters were non-college educated white voters. Now that's declining, but it's become this sort of uh, belief in the Republican Party that somehow to connect to these voters who are less educated, that we have to pretend that education is bad. And I don't think it used to be that way. I mean, Roosevelt seemed to get a lot of working class voters and he was very well educated. He didn't go out and attack universities. Um, and it's completely phony. I mean, you have some of the best educated people in the world like Ted Cruz or Senator Hawley from Missouri talking about elitist. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, we actually have now this belief that is, I think, broadening that colleges are places that indoctrinate students in some left-wing philosophy. And, you know, history will tell us anytime you have a movement that attacks education, you know, be it the Red Guard, uh, nothing good happens. We should, we should value education and aspire to education. And that's, a, I think, a dramatic wrong turn the country's the Republican Party has taken. Well, why did you part participate in this all these years? Well, that question really led me to write this book. Um, and it's, it's a very troubling question to me, and I don't really have a good answer. Um, I think that when you're involved in something like this, particularly on the end of politics, I was in the campaign part of politics. I never worked in government. So I was really about winning. And, you know, to be honest, I was really good at winning. I won more races than just about anybody out there. I helped win races more. Um, and there's a certain intoxication that comes with that. You don't really question it. Um, I found, you know, after the Romney campaign where we lost, I'd worked for the Bush campaign where we won, that I did a lot more reflection on why we lost and why we won. I mean, when you win, you just kind of roll into the next race. And it is tribal. You have a comfortable place in the tribe. You're well compensated. You have people know who you are. You're good at what you do. There's something about that that is just very comfortable. Did you not see any of these things before when you were working with some of your candidates? Like one of the, I can't help but notice that some of the candidates that you helped get elected have been on the forefront of some of these movements. I mean, one of your ca congressional candidates was one of the top uh, sort of defenders of, of President Trump during the impeachment hearings, okay? A, a very aggressive a defender was very much pushed out front because of her aggressiveness. Why do you think you see things as diff so differently 
than they do. I mean, did this never come up when you're having all those hours together of plotting strategy and figuring out what they're going to do? Well, you know, there was sort of a agreement that there was a set of beliefs that we might disagree on this or that issue, but there was a, a sort of fundamental set of beliefs. So what would that be? Personal responsibility, character counts, deficit matters, strong on Russia, uh, pro-legal immigration. I mean, Ronald Reagan announced in front of the Statue of Liberty. He signed a bill that made everyone in the country before 1983 legal. So when you had those sort of belief in that set of core beliefs, it made differences on issues less dramatic because everyone's going to disagree on issues, okay? I mean, I, I sit down at Thanksgiving dinner. I don't agree with my family on everything. But look, it's, it's easy not to be self-reflective. Well, I'm going to go back to something you said at the beginning, though, was race being the original sin of the Republican Party. Even Ronald Reagan, who was a person who obviously was a person who deeply liked people and had a great sympathy for people. I mean, he, you know, had a campaign announcement in Philadelphia, Mississippi. I mean, please you know, where three civil rights workers were viciously murdered. Oh, so yeah. it's, and you know, George H.W. Bush, I mean, you know, I don't think anybody would think that that man's a card carrying racist, but then here he is with the Willie Horton ad. So the fact of the matter is race has been used by the Republican Party for an awfully long time. And my question is why? I mean, does nobody think that that would be destructive at some point? Nobody would think that that would become kind of a, a tiger whose tail you can't, you can't hold on to? Nobody ever thought that? It became this sort of truism inside the Republican Party that the reason African Americans didn't vote for Republicans is that Republicans just weren't good at talking to African Americans. And I write about this a lot in my book, that it was a communication problem, that they just didn't understand what we were saying, that there was a deep entrepreneurial spirit in, in the uh, African American community. They, they had this deep sort of love of family. A lot of them were culturally conservative. We could bond with them. We just knew, had to learn how to talk to them. And I think that was a complete myth. I think African-Americans understood what Republicans were saying very clearly, and they responded. And I think there's been this reluctance to address the core issues of sort of policy that have not favored African-Americans, that Republicans still continue. So, you know, what is our solution? Our solution is payroll tax cuts, when many people aren't benefiting by that. So. I think it's a, uh, a whole combination of issues that really goes to a reluctance to address fundamental policy issues that are not appealing to many of those who are the most disadvantaged in our society. And now you've got, of course, the whole Fox News media industrial complex kind of organized around the kind of the conservative media industrial complex to amplify that message, something that, but you know. Point, look, so look at Lindsey Graham in the last week talking about how nurses, if they were paid $25, $25 an hour, might not come to work. I mean, in this bill, I mean, is there anything more insulting imaginable? The idea that some, this is sort of feeling that people don't want to work. I don't think that's true. I think people do want to work. And I think nurses, the idea that Lindsey Graham would go out and say that, it's just one of these moments when sort of, you know, Michael Kinsey's definition of a gaffe was when a politician tells the truth. And that's just sort of a classic moment of that. It just reflects a deep held belief. Well, why though do, do these candidates continue to get elected? I mean, presumably there are nurses in South Carolina, right? Who might object to these comments. Presumably there are that, medical professionals. I mean, you heard the president the other day in his, uh, in his yes. uh, daily briefing suggest that medical personnel were somehow hiding or hoarding or backdooring these true. medical supplies. Presumably, these are some of these folks voted for President Trump, which actually leads me to my question, which is how do you explain the president's current approval rating? I mean, it's the highest it's been since he took office. Mm -hmm. How do you understand that? Well, if you look around the world, all of these leaders in these countries have been besieged by COVID-19 or, or doing well in polls. I mean, in Italy, the government's at 70% and they're dying like flies. Um, I, I think that's just a natural... Uh, belief that we have to pull together, sort of a reflection of foreign policy ends at water's edge sort of thing. I mean, we forget, you know, Bush went up originally after Katrina. Um, I, I think that that is just sort of something that's very, it's not American, but we see it across the world. I think it's very human to want to pull together. And Trump is the president, so you want to support the president. But at the same time, you see him losing to uh, Biden. 
uh, by almost 10 points in these polls. So I don't really think it means anything. Do you have any hope that enough people agree with you that a change will occur? I mean, what would you like to see going forward? I've pretty much given up hope on that. I mean, I think that we saw an impeachment, the inability for anyone but Mitt Romney to really look at the truth. And there's no question that if Barack Obama had been accused of this and had done this stuff, they would have impeached him in a second. So uh, the idea that the Republican Party as an institution is going to reform itself based on any sort of standards of principle or morality, I think we just have to abandon. We can't believe that. I think the only thing that'll change the Republican Party is utter terror. And that terror will come when they start to lose. So of the Americans under 15, the majority are non-white. So there's some reason to believe that those 15 year olds are gonna become 18 year olds and remain non-white. And that's sort of like a very, very dark sign for the Republican Party because it has really sort of embraced becoming a white grievance party in a way that would have been unimaginable to me not very long ago. So I think when the Republican Party can't win anymore, uh, and we've lost seven out of the last eight popular votes. I mean, I worked for Bush in 2004. It's the last time since 88 that we won the popular vote. So I think that only losing is going to force the party to change. Stuart Stevens, thanks so much for talking with us today.